Hello, my name is Shannon Kemp, the Executive Editor of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining our second installment of the monthly series, Data Diversity webinar series, NoSQL Now, with Dan McCreary. And we'll be discussing migrating security policies from SQL to NoSQL with two guest panelists today. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag NoSQLNow. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Today we have two esteemed guests joining us for the panel today, Adam Redder, founding partner of Exist Solutions and one of the core developers of the Exist Database Open Source Project. And also joining us is Michael Allen, the security architect for Squirrel. Modern panel is Data Diversity's partner and friend, Dan McCreary. Dan is the principal of Kelly McCreary & Associates. He is a price architect and author specializing in merging database technologies. His, he, his wife, Anne, recently published the book, Making Sense of NoSQL, A Guide for Managers and the Rest of Us, which you can find in the Data Diversity Bookstore under Featured Books. With that, I will turn the floor over to Dan to get the discussion started. Hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much, Shannon. You all do great intros for us. Um, I, I just wanted to, first of all, acknowledge the fact that I have two guys that are way smarter than I am here uh, and uh, are, are really experts on actually uh, not just uh, security policies, but actually implementing security uh, in uh, NoSQL databases. Um, Adam I've known for a long time, and uh, Michael uh, just started to get to know through the Squirrel project, uh, or the uh, Apache Cumulo, and he works for Squirrel Data. Before I do the intros, I just want to kind of set the stage for people. Um, and I, uh, there's kind of a quick description of what we're doing. And then we're going to really focus on four areas of security uh, in general, but then we're going to really focus in on um, the hardest things to do within the database, which is authorizing users. And just to give people a background, uh, security policies, when we talk migrating policies, are, are the English language statements about uh, how policies should be enforced. Uh, and it might be policies about authenticating users or authorizing or audit or encryption. And the idea is how are we going to migrate the policies from something you do know well, which is the relational model, uh, to the other models. Um, and then to make sure that uh, everybody uh, has a good background on what we mean, uh, the relational models uh, we call the relational in the upper left-hand corner here. And um, uh, other people are also familiar with the analytical or the OLAP models. Uh, but NoSQL stores bring us four new patterns, key value stores, column, family stores, graph, and document. And um, uh, Michael is an expert on uh, Apache Cumulo, which is the column family in the lower left. And then Adam is an expert on uh, security within document stores. So uh, with that, uh, what I'd like to do is just um, introduce, have the speakers introduce themselves and uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into uh, the NoSQL space. Adam, would you like to start off? Thanks, Dan. Um, so uh, my role, uh, how to describe it, it's quite difficult, I suppose. Um, I'm somewhere between an uh, open source hacker and a consultant. Um, and I predominantly work in the region of databases, um, which is probably as much a surprise to me as anybody else. Uh, having left university, oh, I don't know, 50 years ago now, uh, I just swore that I'd never touch databases again. Um, <laughs> I am surprised to find where I am now. Um, however, um, in about 2005, um, I was doing a lot of work with Excel documents. We were looking for some sort of way to store and query things. Um, and after a bit of trial and error, I uh, came upon existing. Um, and the community were very good. We asked lots of questions. They helped us out. And they were very, very responsive, which is uh, one of the reasons that uh, my current employer chose it at that point. However, it is open. Open source, and we have a few bugs and problems. Um, so eventually, I exhausted their goodwill, um, and it was really up to me to start fixing bugs and sending in patches. <laughs> From the complaint, um, you must ask you to fix the source, right? Yes, yeah, so you, you, you complain a bit, and they help you, and then you can see too much, and they get fed up with you complaining and go and help someone else. Uh, you end up helping yourself and everyone else, obviously. Uh, so I started contributing patches. Um, the sort of reward of doing that in an open source manner um, was quite appealing. 
Uh, it was a very slippery slope. And by the year, I was a full-time committer on Exist, and I have been since. Um, so that's, that's how I got involved in uh, the internals of databases. Uh, on the security side, I've um, always had a bit of an interest in security, both from sort of looking at systems from the outside, um, and obviously competing to a large database project. Um, security is a pretty key thing. Uh, so I guess, I guess that's kind of my fairly informal background of how I ended up here. Mm -hmm. Muscle about yourself and, and how you got into the uh, NoSQL security area. Sure. So, so thanks for having me. And let's see. I I, have a, I think like exactly unlike Adam, I have always sort of liked databases, but I've never worked on one as kind of my job. Um, you know, uh, graduate school, gosh, the 15 years ago as well. Um, I went to work for Sun Microsystems. Systems working in their uh, in their department for a while. And, um, but pre at Squirrel, I worked for the last nine years uh, in PGP, which uh, some of you may know is a, a fairly well-known uh, graphic uh, system. And uh, I was doing a lot of their uh, development work on their server-side products. Um, we were bought by Symantec, and then. Uh, uh, came to Squirrel after that, primarily because I was very interested in gaining some experience in the big data world, and Squirrel just happened to be looking for a security architect at that time. So I think our backgrounds and our interests meshed very, very well at that point. Um, it's kind of interesting to come into this group as a security architect because one, of, and we'll get into this more, but one of Accumulo's big claims to fame that it was built at, with security cement built into kind of the fiber and waft of the database itself. Um, uh, as, uh, as you know, the top of the hour, Dan, one of the hardest problems we have is decide that kind of authorization question of who should be able to see what in the database. And you know, Accumulo has some interesting, uh, and Squirrel has some interesting takes on the air, and I think it's definitely an area of active research and interest uh, within the communities. But that's me in a nutshell. That's that's great. That's a great great introduction for both you guys. So let me just kind of start off with some very uh, uh, general questions, and and just for people that are um, not familiar with kind of the. Uh, uh, Traditional uh, security policies in relational databases. Um, you're, you're, you frequently do this with something called grant statements, where you're going to grant maybe read and write and update, delete access uh, to uh, some things in the database. And often they're tables, uh, but sometimes they're views in tables. And uh, you can also uh, grant access maybe to a stored procedure. But the key thing about relational databases is that people have gotten used to is the fact that they have what we call fine-grain access control. Uh, so you can effectively protect any column. If a column contains, for example, uh, social security numbers, you can protect that from most users, even though they have a reporting tool. Uh, and the reporting tool is only granted to the uh, access to the views, uh, not the underlying tables. Um, one of the things I know is that uh, almost all the databases have very good ways to do to authenticate users, and they, that can be done at the application level. And all of these systems have audit and encryption uh, tools. But actually, what I'd like to now ask both uh, Adam and Michael is, let's talk a little more about um, the security models in your respective um, systems. Adam, you can talk about security models in document stores, and Michael, uh, then uh, after that, talk about security models uh, in Apache Cumulo. Adam, you want to give us a start here? Okay. Um, so, uh, the, obviously, the documents that I'm really familiar with is, is um, Exist. Uh, I've done a bit of uh, research about Hadoop as well uh, to see how that compares. Um, now, in Exist, um, originally what we had is we tried to uh, follow at a very basic level uh, the Unix kind of philosophy. Uh, so, each resource has a owner, a group. As assigned as a mode of permissions. Okay, so for each um, collection of documents, uh, which is much like a directory or document, um, you can set a mode.
load on it, uh, which determines um, if the resource can read, write, or open that uh, collection, for example, or group that defines the resource can do that, or if anybody else that isn't the owner or the group can do that. And um, that's, that's a nice approach in many ways uh, because you've got a very, very simple uh, set of missions. And uh, if you implement it correctly, you can do uh, millions and millions of these kind of security checks every second. So if you want to do a query, um, I don't know, millions of documents. Um, obviously, you only want the user to see what's in a particular document. Uh, it's quite important that you can do these uh, security comparisons quickly, because otherwise, uh, you lose query performance. And really, the problem is not the query necessarily, or the indexing, or anything else, it's a security implementation. So we have uh, this kind of Unix security model. And um, quite true to Unix. So whilst in Unix, you have read, write, and execute. Uh, execute controls whether you can open a, a directory or, in our case, a collection, uh, or whether you can execute a compiled application. Uh, in Exist, we didn't have execute. We had pop date. Uh, and this was done uh, before I got involved in Exist. And I always felt that this was kind of strange because uh, we got right and we've got update. Uh, and the update flag um, was really related to uh, our platform insofar as we have a, a extension to our query language, which is called XQuery. And then there's uh, XQuery update. But that we were able to have separate permissions so that you could write to a document if you want to uh, place it. Uh, wanted to update a node in the document, you have this update flag set. And um, to me, this never really made any sense. Um, so I that this, this had to change, because really an update and a write um, are pretty much the same thing. It was just nonsense from my perspective. We replaced it with the sort of standard uh, emissions. That was, that was the first step to sort of modernize, modernizing our security architecture. Uh, but then we wanted to go further because uh, what we realized is there's quite a lot of pain uh, just having Unix-style permissions when you start getting into uh, kind of build advanced applications. Because uh, if you only have uh, one owner of one group um, that owns direct files or a collection of documents or a document itself, and you want to really, uh, come up with fine-grained security so your, your business says, hey, you know, users can access this, and these users can access this, but these ones can write this, and these ones can read this. Um, if you want to implement that, and you've only got owners and groups, uh, what you end up doing is having an explosion of groups. Uh, like basically, you're creating hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of groups um, and put the right people into the right groups that have these kind of little permissions. And it, it doesn't scale. Um, yeah, it's not manageable. It's scale for a lot of users, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's really not manageable. Um, so you kind of create this thing, and then nobody who uses or administers your system understands how the security works at all. Um, at that point, you've completely lost the plot because you know a security model is great, but if nobody understands how it works, it's effectively useless uh, because somehow someone will assign the wrong security to something, and it, it breaks your whole intent. Um, felt we had to go beyond um, sort of the Unix style permissions of execute. Uh, implemented access control lists. Uh, we, we, we took time to think about this because we've been warned um, by a few people that discuss security with that you know aren't necessarily security experts. That their biggest bugbear when they've been given advanced security controls is uh, understanding how to apply them. So people said oh, no, the, the role-based access control systems that we've seen in Solaris and things like this they're far too complicated. Um, and other people said, well, access control lists are too complicated. I can never understand which uh, access control inventory is being applied. Uh, so we felt we it a bit. Um, but in the end, we felt that access control lists are the best way to go. So the way that we did it is the same way as, that you get in ZFS, which is uh, the feed byte file system that you get in Solaris and now Linux, uh, which is uh, the access control list is applied before the Unix style permissions. So this means you can sort of keep your Unix-style permissions on all your resources, and this is your default. Uh, you can add kind of like additional rules that are created first to say whether a user has access to a resource or doesn't have access to a resource. 
And um, with a little bit of clever implementation, we actually made it faster than the existing implementation. So we were able to add um, for security, uh, reduce amount of memory and disk space used, and the whole thing runs faster. So it's a bit of a win all round, really. Uh, and we're quite we're quite happy with that at the moment in terms of sort of resource-based permission. Uh, but it's it's certainly not the last thing that we'll do. Um, but it's a good step at the moment. So. Yeah, very good. I, I have been using Exist for many years, and uh, the Unix style permission uh, definitely was one, a limitation. Uh, and so I think the the new uh, access control is going to give uh, people, especially people who are sharing uh, complex rules on many projects that involve uh, document management and content management. That's going to be a very nice uh, nice features to have. So I'm looking forward to trying that out. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry for so that. I think that finally triggered. Uh, the implementation of access control list was basically uh, a lot of our users were building their own um, organization systems yep, and authentication systems <laughs> yeah. onto our Unix style permissions. So they were doing stuff at the application level and then mapped down to a few database users. Yep, I did and, it. Yeah, we had a particularly uh, complicated customer where we integrated with LDAP for them. And we were trying to move LDAP users onto a few database users. And, um, for a few weeks of tearing my hair out, I just bit the bullet and um, add LDAP and implemented access control list. So. Yep. Oh, good. Well, um, um, necessi ne necessity is mother invention, as they say. So, all right. That's all right. Good. So, uh, Michael, let's let's kind of take a turn off the document uh, model and talk about um, Col family stores and Apache Cumulo. Sure. So, um, let me set context. Uh, I'm going to turn over the presenter to you, Michael, if you want to uh, sure. uh, f flip your slides. Great. Um, let me in context about Squirrel and Accumulo. Accumulo is actually an Apache project. It's an open source uh, key value store project, one of these highly scalable uh, databases. In the same vein as, as HBase and other things, it's built on top of uh, some parts of the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, Accumulo grew out of a project that was started inside of the National Security Agency. So it was built from the ground up with sort of security semantics in mind, that you're going to have lots of different people accessing the same pool of data at the same time, and you may want to let all of, see all of the data all of the time. But you really need the database to scale out to a massive amount of data. We're talking about terabytes and terabytes up into the petabytes, uh, thousands upon thousands of machines all working in concert to collect X and be able to query over in more or less real time a large set of data. The squirrel was founded uh, in the middle of last year to commercialize the Apache Accumulator technology and to put some functionality on top of it that makes it a little bit easier to use. Uh, when you buy a Squirrel Enterprise, our product, what you get is an interface that allows you to treat the key flow like a document store. You can put JSON documents inside of it or like a graph database. You can have links between those JSON documents that are pre-searched and queried exactly like a graph. And all of those different views on the data basically get decomposed by our software into the key value pairs that are stored inside of Accumulo. One of the big claims to fame is it's, uh, what it's called data-centered security or cell-level security. So every key, val every key value pair inside of Accumulo, and you can think of a key value pair as like an atom of data or a, an entry within a traditional RDBMS like section of one row and one column could be considered a key value pair. Every single one of those little key value pairs can be labeled, called labeling, uh, with a number of sort of arbitrary strings that are kind of the security assertions of your data, uh, that it should only be seen by people with secret access, for example, that it, it's personally identifiable information, or PII if you're uh, familiar with that kind of terminology from the financial or medical world. 
Um, every cell can be tagged slightly differently. These security labels can be anded or ORed together to create some fairly complicated and expressive Boolean uh, pieces of logic. So the upshot of doing all of that is it really allows you to uh, have lots and lots and lots of different kinds of people accessing the same pool of data safely and securely and have a security model enforced at all times, not the applications accessing this piece of data, but by the database itself. Um, a couple of slides here. But the summary, Michael, is that because Apache Accumula was really designed from the ground up to put a very small 64-bit uh, visibility field in every single cell, um, that 64 bits can be used to do pretty arbitrary whatever security policy that you want on uh, access control. Is that a good summary? Well, it's 64 bit limited, but yes, it's a pretty good summary. The, 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 kind of, um, the kind of assertions you can put on there are completely up to the, basically the security designer of the system and the kind of data that you're putting into it. If we think about like a doctor's office or a doctor or a, a major hospital, for instance, that may or may not want to use a Squirrel Enterprise for their for their security and for doing their database uh, work, you the people being able to make appointments to be able to see some amount of personally identifiable information like someone's name and birth date or something like that. Um, you want a uh, billing department person to be able to see what kind of procedures were done so that it can be billed correctly, but may not want them to be able to see a diagnosis out of those procedures. That might be reserved for only nurses within a particular uh, practice. And there are some diagnoses that are extremely sensitive, like if someone has been diagnosed with HIV. Those diagnoses should then only be seen by a particular person's very care physician. Um, all of these kind of semantics, all of these rules can be broken down into this set of sort of secure labels that can be attached to any piece of data inside of Accumula. And those, pieces, and those uh, security assertions are evaluated by the very core of the database as it's seen through and uh, operating on your query. So it doesn't have to reach out to exterior systems in order to understand who should be seeing what at a given moment, all of those decisions are kind of made beforehand before your query runs. The core of the database itself is able to do those evaluations many millions of times a second such that uh, the, the sort of scale to which you can apply this kind of uh, the set of security labels is massive. And it continues to scale out very, very well as your, the size of your data grows and as the size of your user base Grows. Um, those are some of the key tenets that went into the very founding of the Accumulo project and continue through it to this day. Uh, we decided of Squirrel sort of extend that data model to make it a little bit more user friendly, a little bit more approachable uh, by people who don't have familiarity with key value stores as a concept, columnar databases as a concept. You can treat exactly like a document database or a graph database if you're more familiar with those ideas, and uh, and we sort of take care of the work of organizing and uh, implementing those kinds of schemas into the Apache Accumulo value universe. Okay. So I, I just want to make sure that we're clear for the audience. There's a lot of uh, very new databases out there um, in the NoSQL field, and they're, a lot when they're first created, it seems like they haven't really put security as a primary uh, concern, um, and so security seems like in many cases it has to be kind of retrofitted in. Is that a, a fair uh, statement? I would say that's absolutely fair. I mean, most of the databases, most of the RDBMSs that were developed in the 70s and 90s, their job was to index and query data. They weren't really thinking that much about security. Security was applied if it needed to be by applications. And then the number of applications against the database grew out to an extraordinary number. People are realizing all of them are applying slightly different variants on whatever security policies supposed to exist, and, uh, and it becomes sort of this um, a tangled mess. And people wanted security to be pushed back down level into the database somehow. 
And by then, the sort of tenets of how the data is organized, of how it was accessed, of the kinds of questions that a particular database engine could ask in any given moment were already kind of set in stone, if you will. And it was hard for them to sort of reapply those, um, those notions, those security notions, back into it. Uh, still achieve the kind of same scale and the same operational uh, levels that they had in the past. Yeah, I think I, I totally agree from the uh, experiences that I've had. As people went down and, and got an early uh, uh, NoSQL database in and tried to protect it at a, at a coarse grain, and then they couldn't get the same control that they had uh, in relational databases. Uh, we had uh, one uh, person uh, chat a question uh, uh, on the Twitter account uh, to Dataversity, and he asked, um, do you have a, a policy? Uh, says certain columns in a table uh, are private. Um, can you use your software uh, to protect uh, or effectively column your column or data data from a view? Um, and, uh, Michael, you should take it first, and then Adam, you can jump in. Sure. Uh, yes, absolutely. And in fact, um, part of the uh, sort of selling points of, of the whole software on top of Apache Cumulo is you a lot of help with consistently applying labels to data as it comes in. Um, Accumulo basically leaves it up to each application uh, to insert the correct labels into whatever data it's writing into the database. We give you what we call our labeling engine, which allows you to define sort of human readable sets of rules that say, hey, if my data happens to look like this, there happens to be a field inside of a JSON document called draft. That it needs to be labeled as PI type data, and so it needs to get the label PI before it gets placed into the database. Um, so absolutely, you can use our our kinds of software to translate those sorts of uh, policies directly into what you would be using Squirrel Enterprise for. Okay, uh, hey, Adam, can you, uh, are you with us in the? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, t why don't you tell us a little bit about if I wanted if I had an XML document that had. Uh, some else that were had you know uh, numbers in them. H how might I protect uh, those uh, with it within the exist database? So that's a that's an interesting question. Um, so if you, if obviously, if you bought the entire column in as a single document, um, you would just set the security on the document. Um, however, in terms of um, protecting what's in document, um, so you've got something in the document that needs a different security level to something else. Uh, you would have to create something like a view, mm -hmm. and we would please do that using um, a piece of stored X query uh, over something like the uh, REST interface. Mm -hmm. So uh, you would call a URL, and the URL would effectively be executing a stored query, um, and it's that stored query that um, really enforces the permissions um, on the data that you're trying to access in the document. Uh, so you, eff you effectively have a view, a dynamic view, um, and there's another way you could do that uh, from the permissions that you place on the query to determine who can execute that query, and if the query executes um, set ID or set GID, so it's got elevated privileges. Or in the uh, query itself, um, you could enforce the security so you can interrogate um, document and the database and the people in the database and perhaps some sort of poly XML that you've created um, to determine whether that query should allow or permit access to the document. But effectively, um, while it's kind of a little bit application level, um, all of the primitives that you're using are really baked into the database. So it's kind of, I guess, somewhere between application level security and database security when you start doing that. So. Yeah. Uh, we had a question. Uh, that uh, in the Q and A there that uh, the Unix file system is really for file security, but when using views in exist uh, or the cell level labeling, uh, uh, it gives you a much finer grain uh, control. Uh, I think I think that makes sense. So I I think we've answered that question. Um, and then another question uh, for uh, Michael's here then is for Cumulo, the cell level security features are label similar to Oracle's labeled security mechanism. Is that uh, correct? You know, I'm not familiar with that feature of Oracle, so I can't kind of 
definitively one way or another. Um, probably. Okay. It's, it's very good as a company at identifying really good ideas and putting them into the uh, set of Oracle products and selling them at a high price. Right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a good point. I, I should also say that the W3C uh, does have an attribute called PII um, that's associated with, I, I think it's a micro uh, standard, uh, but uh, with XML files, if you have an element and you give it an attribute PII equals true, um, you can apply certain filters that will pull that out in standard views and can kind of do that at a, at a, at a certain level within a lot of your queries. So I know that's a, a, a feature that I've seen in in some of the queries that I've worked with on federal agencies too. So, all right. Uh, so one thing I wanted to mention, we're at about halfway through the point, um, and we have uh, uh, people online here. And if anybody has specific questions, uh, please feel free to open the Q&A um, uh, text box on the right-hand side of your uh, WebEx uh, console, and uh, go ahead and enter uh, any questions. Um, all right, so the next thing uh, I'd like to ask, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll either guys uh, pick this, is um, do you have any sample stories of an uh, organization that has had um, uh, concerns about security and how some newer NoSQL security engines have been able to meet their requirements? Uh, either guy, just jump in here if you have any stories you'd like to share. Uh, no. I don't know that I can specifically talk about any of our particular Customers as like naming them, but certainly <laughs> I mean, in, industry. <laughs> in terms of like, uh, I'll, I'll say this much: in, in terms of broad uh, sort of adoptability kinds of questions, we've talked to any financial institutions that no doubt many of you have heard of. Um, when, when we're talking to uh, are interested in building out these kind of large uh, stores so that they can do fraud analytics or other kinds of uh, other kinds of analysis on them. The primary blocker tend for deploying those kinds of things into the, into these sorts of organizations is how do I comply with my security and privacy laws? And uh, you know, a Cumulo for one and Squirrel for one uh, example gives a strong answer to those uh, kinds of questions in terms of the ability for you to kind of translate the, uh, these sort of policies like SOX compliance and other things, in basically the set of primitives that you need to fill in order to be able to see a piece of data. You need to be in the auditing department, and it needs to be, you know, a little piece of data with, you know, someone's uh, or, or be able to see someone's say name or address. You can all of these kinds of degrees of freedom on individual pieces of data. Uh, if you're doing it with Squirrel, you can do that in a JSON document, so you can have, uh, you know, someone's identifier be protected by one label, but then their um, trades be protected by another set of labels that are available to the audit fraud department, so that the, the two need to sort of come together in order to identify a particular individual, but you can do sort of broad analyses without violating anyone's privacy, and uh, and have those semantics guaranteed not by any particular application or any particular individual, but by the database itself and by sort of core running technology. Makes sense. Uh, I, I, well, there's one, one question kind of related to that. Uh, in the slide that you were showing, you have this policy uh, box lower left-hand corner, and the policy then applies both the labeling engine and the policy engine. Um, how? How do you describe these policies? Are they JSON documents? Are they uh, uh, text uh, things that average business analysts could read, or is it mostly program code? Well, um, I think the first step of any policy is an English document that describes what rules that you're trying to uh, force, and what are the what are the people that you're trying to sort of think about accessing the system at any given time. What kind of people are they, and so on and so forth. When you sit down past that level into trying to figure out how am I going to model my data in order to enforce these notions that start from this English document, 
Squirrel approaches this is there are two kinds of policies. One sort of applies to data that's coming in, and one that applies to data as it's being read. So the sort of write path and the read path have separate separations because they're trying to answer a sort of separate um, tasks. When you're writing data, you're trying to figure out well, what kind of data is this, and, be, and due to Accumulo's semantics and how it works, you need to figure out what to what labels do I apply to any particular piece of data. Those rules like a specialized language that we developed in-house that looks like a SQL query. Um, so they're as readable as sort of SQL tends to be. Okay, um, a high-level DSL, domain-specific. Exactly, it's a domain-specific language. And they say, you know, apply this set of labels to this part of a JSON document if it meets these sort of requirements, like if it has this kind of side of it or if it's at this level of the document or, you know, so on and so forth. Um, for the policy engine on read time, the question it's trying to answer is, is all right, um, you know, Adam is coming in and he is in the auditing department of my bank, so what labels, what sort of set of labels does that give Adam at this time? And, um, there are different variations on how you answer that question of what are ad labels. You can sort of think of human institutions and what their sort of security requirements are. Um, well, we our, our policy engine is probably the least flesh of this uh, picture, but we're, it's definitely an area of active engine work going on right now. Now you can tie our uh, our our data back into your LDAP systems for both for doing authentication and also for doing authorization. So right now your options are things like, like well, you can tie it back to the types of sort of members of the security group uh, notions inside of an app directory. Those can become your labels if that's what you want to do with your, your particular data at a given time. You can also just give um, Squirrel and Accumulo sort of a list of saying, well, Adam's labels are this, and I compute whatever this is by running a SQL crowd of band and generating a text file and loading that into Accumulo itself. Uh, so there's all kinds of options here, and it's definitely an area where we, where we are actively developing more interesting, more flexible answers. Uh, definitely Zacamole is something we're looking at as uh, one sort of potential piece of this puzzle in terms of how you define a policy for a policy engine that sort of defines whether or not uh, particular people can see a particular piece of data. Uh, Zach is definitely an interesting, mature standard. It also, um, in its intent, answers a slightly different question in that Zachable sort of policies tend to say, can Adam see thing X? And the question that this policy engine box is really trying to answer is, is what does Adam see? Which right. is a slight impedance mismatch. But we're, we're uh, working with our customers and we're Working, you know, outside partners on trying to figure out how to sort of best give tools to security officers, business analysts, these kinds of folks that they can both understand how to use, like how do I express this, and how, what kind of knobs do I have, and I don't want to program in Java, heaven forbid, but also, you know, need more expressivity than, you know, off uh, kinds of uh, options. So. Uh, it's definitely an area we're continuing to look at. Yeah. Well, let's ask Adam some questions here. Um, and, and I know that uh, you've been working in the security domain for a while, um, and I know that in the past the uh, exit system also had uh, some support for uh, Zacamole. And for people that uh, aren't familiar with Zacamole, it's an XML standard for trying to express uh, security assertions um, and, and policies from that. Adam, do you want to? Talk a little about that and, and your work in there. Sure, I, I, I can certainly talk about uh, a little bit about uh, Zacamole and Exist. Um, I can't particularly talk about my work with Zacamole uh, simply because Zacamole was uh, implemented in Exist before I even started uh, contributing to Exist. Uh, so it's really been in Exist for some time. Uh, although at the moment we actually mark it as a deprecated feature. Uh, the reason okay. for that is uh, twofold. The Zacamole implementation that we have um, 
doesn't actually control access to the data. What it does is it controls access to the executable code in so far as at a really, really fine lane, uh, fine grained level. Uh, you can use Zacamol to control um, who, um, to what circumstances can execute various functions in the database. Uh, so even if you have a, a modular functions um, written in an X query or Java, uh, you can literally uh, turn on and off individual functions uh, based on using criteria at that time. Uh, so it's, it's very, very powerful for sort of controlling uh, what you can do with the data as opposed to um, access to the data effectively. Uh, now, the reason that it's deprecated um, is because it's uh, an implementation, I think, of Zacamol 1, uh, possibly 2. Um, and it's whilst it works, um, I think the implementation isn't really up to scratch. Uh, performance is an issue, <laughs> and right, it, it right. often is. <laughs> then um, I wouldn't uh, recommend using Zacamol and Exist at the moment. Uh, now, I think I mentioned uh, Zacamol is quite mature, and uh, Zacamol free is kind of out there and played with at the moment. Uh, so I think it might be, you know, could you uh, basically uh, a reimplementation of Zacamol and exist, um, keeping the idea that you know you can control the absolute uh, new uh, functionality in exist, but also um, try to apply some of those concepts to uh, accessing nodes inside documents. So take the security down below uh, the document level without to use sort of dynamic views. Um, we had uh, a question just come across uh, about views and labeling, um, and it sounds like, uh, and the question is, do they go hand in hand, or do you use one or another? Uh, either comment on that? Uh, I'll jump in. The, the view is something that I sort of think about is very tied into the RMS model of the world where you are basically you have you know tools and they have rows and columns and then you are applying you know they are always being select query on one particular set of those, joining all those together creating sort of another virtual table that's driven of uh, the data within within the the views uh, table. Um, NoSQL uh, tends to take an attitude of like joins add. Uh, if you will, uh, if, we, if we oversimplify it for a minute, <laughs> in that you know, it's very expensive to do, and um, you uh, you know, if you're always running sort of within the auspices of one node, one network node, then joins become very expensive when you start talking about doing them over a distributed system. Right. So NoSQL sort of takes an attitude of like, hey, let's let's formalize a little bit and not do joins as much as possible. And if necessary, you can do joins up in an application at an application level. Um, so the notion of a, of a view on the data, we sort of consider using labels uh, as one way of sort of thinking about a very security-oriented view in terms of like, if you have these labels and they're attached to your data and this user comes in, they're only going to see a particular slice or set of slices out of um, any given set of documents. Uh, it's, not a, it's not like a view in the sense of, of a school view where you're doing some kind of transformational um, theta. You might be combining columns or doing aggregations over columns or things like that. So Enterprise offers features that are kind of like those features in terms of being able to do those kinds of transformational things and, uh, and aggregations and things like that. Um, we don't call it a view per se. Right, right. So I guess. Um, sorry. So I've been using the term view. Um, it, it's not really what I call it, but I'm trying to perhaps put it more into a relational database parlance. Um, so really, really think about it as a materialized sort of property results of a query. <laughs> but that probably mean anything to anybody that hasn't used exist. So. I, I I think of views as a subset of a uh, or or sometimes a superset of a of a single physical table. Sometimes joining in other areas. Um, I think the one thing that mon many people in the distributed 
uh, processing area have is that when you talk about joins, they, they in general think of moving data between nodes in a cluster, which is, you know, kill performance. Uh, and the NoSQL uh, mantra seems to be uh, much more moving queries to each node, having that node processes sending uh, uh, maybe a small subset of a, a, a large table back, uh, and, and that would be a typical thing you'd see in a MapReduce transform, too. So um, uh, that makes sense. All right, so let me uh, ask, either of you guys, we're about core two, uh, and uh, so we got about uh, 15 minutes left. Are there any topics that you guys think are, are uh, really critical for people that are kind of new to this area? I, I think one of the things our audience really has is they, they really have a strong familiarity with relational databases and relational security. Uh, but coming to this area, what are the things that they should think about? Um, and let's kind of make some assumptions. I'm assuming that almost all uh, these databases uh, have kind of authenticate users, uh, support things like OpenID. Um, uh, a lot of them are starting to put in Kerberos authentication. And I'm also uh, have much more mature audit uh, tools. Uh, the one thing uh, that is relatively new for a lot of databases is encryption level tools uh, within databases. Uh, do you guys have any, any big thoughts that you'd like to share about uh, uh, tales, cautionary tales about selecting these systems? Uh, Go ahead, Adam. Sorry. Um, I mean, if I could give any advice on security, and I think uh, Michael's really the expert here, so you know, feel free to contradict me. Uh, I would say start with the simplest thing possible that works for you. Uh, I've seen many uh, customers who think that they need the most complicated security thing, um, and a lot of it is because they're they're worried um, because so it's their job. Or, or something, you know, it, it's not because they actually need this security because a lot of my customers aren't, you know, banks and things like that. Some of them are, but uh, most of them are fairly, you know, normal kind of organizations. Um, yet a lot of people pack about security, so they kind of over-prescribe this idea. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't, you know, people that need that. But when you sit down to, to talk to them, you actually realize pretty soon um, that they really need everything that they think they need. Um, you can still achieve the same level of security. Uh, you just really need to talk through um, requirements. Um, so that's the only piece of advice I'd give is start simple, uh, because I've seen a lot of people that build these incredibly complicated security architectures before they've even decided uh, really what their system needs to do. And uh, it, it never really works out well. So. I'll echo some of Adam's sentiment there. When I approach customers or speaking to anybody about security for these for these kinds of systems, it's really for database systems and these new NoSQL systems are highly distributed, um, you know, have lots of users, tons of data, and may or may not cross even geographic boundaries. The first thing I try and orient people towards is like, like what is the what is the threat you're trying to protect against, like. What's the human level thing that's that's going to happen that you're worried about that that we help you sort of figure out what the right level of stuff to do about it is? Um, if people sort of start in with like, security tools, let me do X, Y, and Z. So I got to do X, Y, and Z. Then they can lose sight very quickly of wait a minute, what was the picture thing? What was the thing I was really worried about? What's the thing that's you know, not going to let me sleep at night. Uh, my, uh, sort of said one of my jobs is letting people sleep at night. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, although not haunt anyone's dreams, that's not part of the package. Um, so, if you're thinking of that, you know, forget it. Um, the thing uh, about something you brought up, Dan, encryption. Um, I was hired into the Squirrel to basically uh, do an encryption module for. Um, Cumulo for its data at rest. Um, that's coming out very soon in the next release of the Cumulo. And one of the interesting parts about that isn't so much how you implement the encryption. That's pretty much a by the numbers, paint by the numbers engineering task of like just make sure you 
your use description primitives correctly, which it takes domain knowledge, but isn't isn't a super amount of rocket science. A hard question as you've implemented the encryption is what are you doing with all of the keys that you just in order to lock things down. If you got sort of taking that into consideration, essentially what you've done is put all of your data inside of a very secure safe, and you have locked that safe with a crazy long digit combination that takes four cells and three men to do all at once. You've taken that combination and you've written it on a post-it note and you've pasted it to the side of the safe. <laughs> So yeah, you really got to think about, okay, well, now I just created this, this big security apparatus. How do I manage the keys for that security apparatus? Who can get those keys? What, what actors? Some of these are people. Most of the time for these big NoSQL systems, they're actually servers. And servers aren't people. They are always on. They need to crash sometimes. They need to. Uh, because that's just something that happens. So when they reboot or come back up, they're going to need to get that key again. So how do they do that? How do they sort of prove themselves to whatever system you're using to manage those keys? Those are really, really important questions in order to really make sure that you've implemented a, a security feature like encryption correctly. Um, and, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I think Squirrel and Accumulo really bring strongly to the table is a lot of expertise in that area. Yeah, um, I just add that uh, set key management, um, if you can get it right, it's a beautiful thing. Um, you know, a centralized key server um, that you know the systems have access to. Um, but recently, working with a client who uh, hadn't got it right and they had a centralized key management system, um, and users were effectively loading keys from there onto a USB disk, um, walking to the server room. Uh, plugging to a server and uh, uploading the key into the application to unlock the data they needed. Uh, the key that they were putting on the, this USB key was completely unencrypted. Um, there was nothing there at all. Uh, yeah. It completely defeated the entire point. So. Interesting. Uh, one of our listeners, uh, Ellen List, uh, List just asked a question, um, and she asked, uh, how can the solutions uh, presented prevent a marketing firm from binding data sets with uh, demographic information um, uh, to uh, find out maybe a, a unique person identifier. Um, a little, little, that's kind of a general question. Uh, either you guys want to take a crack at that? I'm not quite understand the question. I'll, I'll take a crack at it. So, a little sort of oriented answer to that question of like, how do you sort of separate someone? Demographic data from their personally identifiable data, or their sort of what they did in a particular web application as sort of marketing kind of information from actually did those actions, is to set different labels onto those different pieces of data, and so that the marketing people inside the marketing department cannot obtain labels that they should not have access to. Um, it gets into a very interesting question about how anonymous is a particular piece of data and what constitutes a personally identifiable piece of data. Right. Um, was that uh, strata, uh, you know, one sort of rim but very interesting fact that I picked up is that if you know your date of birth and your zip code, I can identify you with about 87% accuracy as a unique person. Right. So I can find that, that with another thing that sort of lists out, lists out who you are. Yeah, so, yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, so, um, you know, it goes back to a lot of context about, what, you know, what we're talking about in terms of, like, not being able to combine these things because what's on one side of that fence or another can lead someone who's got some skills into being able to identify a particular person based on what would be fairly limited sets of information. Another random fact is that HIPAA has a lot of rules about what, what constitutes anonymized data. And one of those rules is that ages within a, a, uh, within a data set 
if they over, say, about 80 or 85, they have to kind of stop there. You can't actually put someone's actual age in past a certain point because right. few people are old. And you can be sort of identified then from the various other pieces of data within a particular uh, uh, data set. So I, I think the answer to the question is really uh, you really do have to limit the amount of data that you uh, provide marketing if they really have the intent of reverse uh, – of, of actually escalating uh, different level people for marketing campaigns. There's uh, more data that you give them, the easier it's going to be to narrow down uh, who that person might be from publicly accessible data. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. All right. So we're about five minutes to here. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, either of you guys, did you have any upcoming projects that you're working on, um, things that the audience should know about? Uh, Adam, you want to tell us a little bit about the book uh, coming up? Sure. So um, myself and uh, Eric Siegel, uh, who's another sort of uh, pretty experienced Exist user, uh, have been co-authoring a book called Exist for O'Reilly. Uh, it will be available early access in mid to late January, and we hope to have it in print for the first couple of weeks in February. It will be well. So, uh, you have a, a lot of very detailed chapters on security, and I was I was very impressed by the technical content of that. Yeah, I'm very excited um, in the security chapter. Um, so it's probably one of the heavier ones in the book. Um, I know how that but... feels. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm good. Yay. Um, so, so that's pretty cool. Um, and if anybody's interested, uh, um, Really, really great uh, conference in Prague in February called XML Prague. Um, all the developers will be there, including myself. And uh, you're really desperate. Hopefully, we'll be giving away a few copies of the book there as well. That, that's a fantastic conference. My wife and I went uh, a couple of years ago. It's uh, had, a, had a great time and some really smart people there. So we love that. Uh, Michael, what are you up to in the next couple of months here? Uh, you know, I don't have anything that I can sort of personally plug, but well, I, I'll, I'll plug someone else's efforts in that uh, there's an Accumulo O'Reilly book that is under uh, under development right now. It's in early access, so if you want to learn more about Accumulo and kind of how it works and what you can and can't do with it, uh, I encourage you to go, go to the uh, O'Reilly website and get that early access edition uh, on sale. Uh, the e Book of the week or something like ebook day a while back might come back around so keep your deal for that if you're looking for a for a deal or information I think the full book is uh, isn't due out until the next year but uh, uh, the early chapters are there okay. and then I'll just say if you guys if, if anyone has any follow-up questions or wants more information or bounce ideas off of things I'm uh, available Michael at squirrel.com sqrrl.com or uh, supermallon on Twitter. All right. Thank you very much. You guys have been fantastic. I, I do want to thank you guys both for uh, uh, helping out and uh, sharing your, your information. Um, we will be posting show notes for this. Uh, and I think, uh, Michael, you had some, some uh, good presentations out there in the web, and Adam has some there too. We'll make sure to get those in there. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Shannon, and thank you guys very much much. Thank you guys for this great uh, discussion and to all of our attendees with for fantastic questions. I just love it when everyone gets involved. Um, and again, as Dan said, uh, I will get that information out to you, the recording of this session along with the slides and links to everything out there that has been mentioned throughout the session. And just so you know, there is a U.S. holiday on Thursday and technically Friday. Uh, so the email may not go out to end of day Monday. It goes out within two business days, but we'll, I'll try and get it out as early as possible for you. So I hope everyone has a happy holidays, and thanks so much for attending. And thanks, Adam and Michael and Dan, for this great discussion. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks a lot, everybody. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. All right.